My name is Yvonne, and I'm an alcoholic. The first thing I'd like to do is to mind my manners and to thank the committee for asking me, and I talked with Peter on the telephone, fell in love with his voice, and uh, it's just really a joy and pleasure for me to be here. For the purposes of identification, I would like to say to you, so that you will know that I said I was an alcoholic, I have a... I, had dual problem because I was also an attorney and a retired judge. And if that doesn't make you unmarketable and alcoholic synonymous and unteachable, I don't know what that. But I think that it does signify a degree of uh, egotism when people like me believe that we can take another person's liberty and property and... Uh, and uh, their freedom and everything else in our hands and deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I guess that's really the supreme mark of uh, being an egotist, plus the fact that when we come into this program, we are completely and totally unteachable. Unteachable. I think the first thing that they had to do with me was just uneducate me and then re-educate me and if there's anybody here who feels that they are getting this program and that you are part of the intelligentsia of Alcoholics Anonymous, like I felt, or that you want to analyze everything that is being told to you, I'm going to suggest that you leave your head outside because, damn it, that's what got you here. <laughs> and they used to say to me when I came into the program, I always reminded them that I had a lot of of degrees, that I was highly educated, and that I was uh, flounding around the doctorate of jurisprudence. And one old man said to me, well, I know something else that has a lot of degrees, and it's called a rectal thermometer. <laughs> I like to tell this story on myself. It's about last week, and uh, there was a person that I didn't particularly like by the name of John Rankin. And then I picked up the obituary, and he died. So I called the funeral home, and I said, Do you have a John Rankin there? And they said, Yes, we do. He died yesterday. I said, Thank you. And so the next day I called the funeral home, and I said, Do you have a John Rankin there? And they said, Well, yes, we do. His funeral is today. I said, Thank you. So the day after that, I called the funeral home again, and I said, Do you have a John Rankin there? And they said, well, no, we don't. His funeral was yesterday. Aren't you the lady that has been calling here for three days? I said, yeah. I said, I just keep liking to hear that he's dead. <laughs> now, that's what I'm like now. <laughs> or you can imagine. I uh, have had to learn through this program to change my attitude, to change my priorities. That story is about the real me. And uh, that's how I would really be if I didn't have to watch it just about every five minutes. And, uh, well, I guess up here, I don't know, in this part of uh, the country, I don't know whether you all give your sobriety date or not. I don't know why they do that down home and in Texas and California and so forth, but my sobriety date is February the 11th. Oh, damn, listen to this. 1969. Woo! <laughs> That's just about unbelievable to me and uh, most of the people that, I, that were alive when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. I guess the reason they do that is so that when you speak at conferences, there are people out in the audience attending the conference and they say, well... That person hadn't really been sober long enough to know what's going on. Or on the other hand, if you have a little bit of sobriety, they punch the newcomer that's sitting next to them and say, well, you think they'd have learned more in that length of sobriety. Or, in my case, just don't do what she did, and you'll be okay. I've had a lot of uh, changes that have taken place in my life just constantly, you know, over a, over a number of years. And uh, people at home, they'll, 
in meetings, they'll say, I'm so-and-so and I'm a real alcoholic. And I don't know what that means unless you have phony alcoholics. Because I, I think it says in the, in the big book someplace, if you're a real alcoholic like we are, you know, but they will always have gerunds or adjectives that identify what kind of alcoholics they are. And it reminds me of the old timers that sit at the back of the room and they get in a big argument in the AA meeting whether the exact nature of your wrongs are the same thing as your character defects. Well, you know, I don't care what they are. But that seems to be, you know, the big discussion. And I sit there and I want to say, okay, guys, come on, let's get on with the meeting. You know, let's talk about resentment. The whole point is that you just don't intellectualize this thing. There is no way that it can be done. There are no answers that can be found. And there isn't anything, any way that you can rationalize it. Alcoholics Anonymous is just a complete miracle, and it works. And even though we have a chapter in our big book that says how it works, I'm here to tell you that I don't know. I'm not an expert on this disease. All I know is that it just does work. And all you have to do is just do what you're told. And that's extremely hard for me to do because never in my life have I ever done anything with a set of instructions. The first thing you do when you get any kind of gadget is you put the instructions aside and you put it together, backwards maybe. And then, after all the attempts have failed, you sit down and read the instructions to see how to do it. And that's the way I was with living. I tried everything in the world to find a way that I could drink successfully. And if I could have found a way that I could have maintained that feeling that we get when we are on that plateau and we've got an empty stomach and we've got about four good belts in us and man, we're sailing and we feel good and we feel as good as, I'd still be drinking. I like that feeling. And like it says in the big book, that I think, and it's the only place in the big book that, that tells why any of us are alcoholic. I always worried about that. Because I could never find a reasonable explanation as to why I was an alcoholic. And then someone suggested that I read Dr. Silkworth and his opinion. And in that book, I think it's XBII or something. I just can't stand people who quote the big book and tell you the paragraph and the page. But it's in there somewhere. And it says that men and women who drink alcohol drink primarily for the effect. And that was the answer. The answer for me. I never liked the taste of it. I could not stand any kind of alcoholic beverage that was straight on the rocks. I could not stand beer. I just didn't like alcohol as far as tasting it. I like mixed drinks where it was concealed in its flavor, but I always drank for the effect. And when I understood that, I began to figure out that maybe this is the place where I belong. I told you what my sobriety date was. Well, the truth is, <laughs> that I knew about this program and came to Alcoholics Anonymous when I was in my 20s. And I uh, attended my first meeting in 1959. I had known about Alcoholics Anonymous since 1950, way back when it first started. And I had an intellectual understanding of this program. And I knew about the steps because my mother was an alcoholic and... When I grew up, I went through all of the things that children of alcoholics have to go through. If you're the child of an alcoholic, you stop and you remember. When you come home from school, you'd look to see how the car was parked in the driveway. Or maybe it was halfway through the garage door. And then you knew when you went in that you didn't know what the conditions would be, whether she'd be asleep, or whether she'd be happy, or whether she'd be morose, whether she'd be crying, whether she would start blaming me for whatever was wrong. And I didn't know how to go in the door. I didn't know whether to tell her I'd had a good day at school, because she probably wasn't interested. 
And so that's the way I grew up. And I knew that if I could just be in control of things, that everything would be okay. If I could control the drinking, and we uh, had all of the family difficulties back then. We had the Friday night fights before they ever had television. <laughs> and uh, my daddy just trotted down to the courthouse all the time filing for divorce and then she had promised she wouldn't drink anymore. And then she'd get drunk again. And it was just one round after another. And I had a little brother 13 years younger than I. And so it became my job to take care of him. On the count of, we didn't know what shape she was going to be in. So my little brother and I would look in the toilet tank and find hidden whiskey, pints of whiskey. See, we, we had bootleggers in those days. You couldn't buy any whiskey anywhere in a whiskey store. And then we'd look under the house, and then we'd grab the pints that we could find, and we'd go back and we'd empty them out in the creek out back. And then she'd say she hadn't been drinking and she'd be falling down. And it was just, you know, this the same thing in every alcoholic home. Absolute chaos and pandemonium. Until one day she read an article. And it was in, I think, Look Magazine. It's all about a guy by the name of Bill Wilson. Something about alcoholics that get sober. And so the first thing I knew, she was going to these meetings. And uh, it took her a while to get the drift of the program. And finally, I think in 1952, it was 1952 on Christmas Eve, she was cooking the Christmas turkey, and she got drunk, and it burned up, and we had a fire in the kitchen. And that was the last drink that she had. And somehow the meetings took off, and those members of Alcoholics Anonymous started hanging around. And they'd come to our house, and they would bring in wet drunks, and they would sit on the couch, and they'd talk to that poor, stupid drunk, and they'd say, do you think you can make it five more minutes? One thing that I am grateful for today is that I was able to be a witness of the early days in Alcoholics Anonymous when 12-step work was 12-step work. And I saw how the drunks got sober. And I saw how the other drunks loved them into sobriety. And they'd say... Do you think you can go five more minutes? And the old guy would say, yeah, maybe. And they'd get up and they'd walk the floor with him, one on each side. And they would give them back then tomato juice and sauerkraut. It was horrible. And I remember that they would talk about steps of AA, and there were 12. And they'd talk about the preamble. And I would sit around the kitchen table. I understood all that. The only thing that I didn't understand was that I couldn't, under, I couldn't see why people couldn't quit drinking because, or due to their own willpower. If something makes you sick and you throw up and it makes you do crazy things, you don't do that anymore. And so I thought if my mother were a strong person, she wouldn't drink. And all of this stuff is poppycock. And it's okay for them simply because she wants to believe that malarkey. They're keeping her sober. And it made it nice at home. And the folks weren't fighting. And she wanted to go for that cult business. It was fine with me because it was a matter of convenience. And I wasn't embarrassed anymore. And I remember when they had the preamble that used to read that the only requirement for membership was the honest desire to stop drinking. And then they had to change that. And they took the word honest out. And everybody had to vote on that in meetings and stuff. Because they figured out that nobody that ever came into AA had any honest desires to stop drinking. You know? Because nobody was honest. And so they struck that from the preamble. And... I remember back, they would have discussions around the breakfast room table 
about the tradition, about the anonymity at the level of press, radio, and, te- and television. That was a big deal. And they would discuss those things, and it was kind of, you know, like Robert's Rules of Order, I figured. And they had to have rules that they had to meet by and with. And so I was there. I saw Alcoholics Anonymous in its genesis. And I'll tell you something, I didn't want anything to do with it. I knew what alcoholics did. I knew what the symptoms were. I did not understand the compulsion to drink or the obsession. I did not understand uh, the lack of willpower. But it seemed to be growing in numbers. There weren't many women in AA then, and I was convinced that they met in garage apartments with secret knocks, and they had secret handshakes, and they'd meet each other on the street and identify themselves, you know, and uh, that it was a, it was a subterranean uh, organization. It was all underground, and everything was secret. They wouldn't give their last names. And so... It started thriving, and I went along my merry way with the intellectual insurance that I would never be an alcoholic, because alcoholics went to jail, and alcoholics went to mental institutions. Alcoholics went then to drying out hospitals, and they would pump them full of some kind of peraldehyde or something in order to keep them from going into DTs. And sometimes alcoholics would go into DTs when you were 12-stepping them. And you would work with them and you would go through the DTs with them. And you'd stay with them hour by hour. And my mother used to say, you never loan an alcoholic any money because they say they're hungry. And what you do is you feed them because if they're wet, they'll just go out and take the money and buy a bootleg pint. And they had certain rules that they lived by. And they kept working with the drunks, and it kept growing and growing and growing and becoming more successful. And that was fine, and I was really ashamed that my mother had to do that. But by the same token, my folks were still together, and my brother was growing up in a non-alcoholic home. And so, having never been to jail, having never been to a drying-out hospital or to a mental institution... (coughs) I went ahead and I trudged my own road and I did the things that tried to make me comfortable. I was a control freak because I knew that if I had things under control, that's all I ever knew when I was living at home, that things would be okay. And I had every one of the personality traits that alcoholics have. I was an absolute perfectionist. I was an overachiever. I would do anything anything in order to make my grades in school because I knew that if I made straight A's in school that I wouldn't be better than but I'd just be equal to because I had such a sense of a lack of self-esteem and not belonging and I never belonged and so I set about to do that and I cheated I did whatever it took. I remember one time I had made a C on an English test, and I needed to make an A because I was going to make straight A's that semester again. And so that C grade needed to be changed. And I uh, studied the teacher's ink pen. I studied her ink. And I knew when she went to lunch. And so she went to lunch, and one day... I went into the room with a proper ink pen, and the teacher had written a C, and I put a leg on it, and it looked like an A, and I want to tell you, it was perfect. I didn't make a single mistake. And I left the room, and uh, somehow or another, another teacher, the geometry teacher, had seen me enter the room. And so she reported to Miss Link, my English teacher, that someone had gone into her room during the lunch hour. And uh, she gave a description. And so, 
I had Miss Link first hour after lunch. Miss Link called me to the desk, and she wrote a note. She said, would you take this to Miss Gordon? And so I opened the note, of course, when I got into the hall, and it said, is this the girl? Well, with the alcoholic mind that I had then, before I ever even had had a drink, I just went into the restroom, and I found a girl that had real black hair, and she was kind of heavy set, and I was only about five foot two. And so I said, I'll give you 50 cents if you'll take this note into Miss Gordon. She says, yeah. She took the note into Miss Gordon. Miss Gordon wrote, no. And the girl came out, handed the note to me, and I went back to Miss Ling's room. And I have never been detected to this day. <laughs> and the statute of limitations is run. <laughs> but my whole point being that I would do anything, anything to achieve. I even won a scholarship to college. I graduated from college, and uh, I don't know. I was always real lucky at getting jobs, and I uh, had already commenced my social drinking. I'd been drunk many, many, many times. But you see, I knew that I would never be an alcoholic, and I was just one big-time party girl. I was just in it for all the fun that I could get out of it. And it was a social thing to do because that's what kids do. And so I, uh, I got a television program on a leading television station in uh, Oklahoma City. I got a radio program. I worked for an advertising agency. I went to New York, and I worked in New York for an advertising agency, and our account was Kessler Smooth Silk Whiskey. I will never forget that. And we got to, to sample the product a lot and uh, drank all of the time that I was in New York City. And then I got a call from my congressman, and uh, he asked me if I would like to come down to Washington, D.C. And, and work on the Hill as a secretary. I said, fine. I was gone the next day. And I went down there, and if you want to find real fun, if you're an alcoholic, go live in Washington, D.C. It's just like a dog in a meat house. And they have parties every day and all day, and it's just, it's wonderful. And all of the whiskey is free if you're a female. And I just absolutely had the time of my life. But things began to get boring, and I decided, well, I'll just enroll in law school. And so I did in Georgetown. And I worked on the hill, and I continued to drink. And I was working in the daytime, attending law school in the afternoon, and I sat next to a, a doctor who was, a, you know, a general practitioner. Now, why he wanted a law degree, I don't know. But we became friends, and uh, we had some finals to study for, and so he explained to me that there was some medicine that I could take, and I could study and stay up late and take the finals. And so he gave me an open-ended prescription, <laughs> and that lasted for three years, and it was wonderful. And I was just as crazy as a March hare. And I returned to the state of Oklahoma, and uh, I took my last year of law school in Oklahoma. And my mother was big time now on Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, she was going to meetings, she was sponsoring people, and those jerks were still coming over to our house. And they were still sitting around talking about the dumb steps. And they'd talk about the third step, and I just wanted to puke. Just, you know, that was insane. You're supposed to be strong. You're supposed to have self-confidence. You're supposed to be able to handle your own life. And especially I was going to law school, and I was going to be handling everybody else's life. And I didn't buy any part of this. People in Alcoholics Anonymous were weak, weak. And so I graduated from law school, and lo and behold, it happened again. I was the only girl in my graduating class, and I got the best job that any law graduate had that year. I became the law clerk of the chief judge of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. Now, that's federal court, and that's right next to the United States Supreme Court. And this man that I went to work for... Uh, his name was Judge A.P. Murrah, and he had had a reputation back in the 20s when 
he worked in Seminole, Oklahoma, and it was a boom town, an oil town. He drank a lot, and they called him Fish, but not to his face. And so I worked for Judge Murrah, and then, you know, I had been in a couple of marriages, and they were totally unsuccessful because my career was the most important thing. And things had always gone great for me, but my drinking had increased. While I was working for the judge, we were holding court in Denver, Colorado, and I went to the Brown Palace that night, and the judges were all drinking, and I commenced to drink with them. Now, at that point in time, (laughs) when I had a couple of belts, I was ready to really party. And so I became, as we all do, we reach that point when we are insolent and we are snotty and sarcastic and degrading and belittling. So I said a couple of bad things, you know, to some of those judges, and I don't know. You know, I probably danced on the table, but I knew that I was in deep trouble the next morning when I woke up. And I said, well, what am I going to do? i got to save my job. So I called Alcoholics Anonymous. I thought, that's a good front. So I went to a meeting that night in Denver, Colorado, and uh, they sent me to the slippers group. And they passed out little matches. I didn't know what they meant, but they had a little shoe on there, and it looked like a little Cinderella shoe. took me years to figure out that was slippers, the slippers group. And they talked about the problems they had in staying sober. And they had a lot of old-timers there. And the old-timers talked about, A, being in jail, B, losing families, three, going to drying out hospitals, and all of the junk and the garbage that I had heard around the breakfast room table. And so I identified myself right out of Alcoholics Anonymous because none of that stuff had ever happened to me. And if it hadn't happened, I knew what the symptoms of alcoholism were. I knew that you had to drink in the morning. I knew all the things that you did. I said, if I don't do any of those things, I will never be an alcoholic because I have all of this intellectual insurance. And so my life proceeded for the next ten years. And I guarantee you I started doing everything that you told me I was going to do. And all of the things started happening to me. I remember sitting around that breakfast room table. They had a stupid test with 20 questions. And I, you, took all, you took your answers and you added them up. And, and if you had two questions or more that you had answered yes to, it said at the bottom of the page, you might, you know, consider that you have a drinking problem. I answered about ten, you know. I'd already experienced blockouts. And so I thought, well, those guys are hustling members. And what they want to do, they're all trick questions. It's like, have you stopped beating your wife? And so all they want to do is get a lot of yes answers, and then they can get new members in this cult that they've got going, the underground organization. And so I knew your questions were deceitful. But the things that I remembered that alcoholics do, I still didn't do. Wouldn't drink in the morning, and uh, never thrown in jail, and sick. I was sick every time that I drank. If there is a vomiting champion in America, it's me. I could do a projectile back to that wall. (laughs) And it made no difference whether or not I had been drinking the night before. I would wake up stone cold sober in the morning and still run and throw up in the toilet. Just conditioned response. The dog and the saliva, you know? You just throw up in the morning. (coughs) I never did have a pleasant time drinking because I always threw up. And I've been known to throw up in just the best places. You know, in the officer's club at Andrews Air Force Base and uh, in the honky-tonks in northeast Oklahoma City, in my plate, at McDonald's, uh, you know, wherever. I just threw up. That was part of the deal. Then when you throw up, what do you do? You start drinking again. Because then you get to start all over and it'll be another hour or two, you know, before you have to go through that exercise. 
And it's the insanity and the progressiveness of the disease. And I had no idea what was happening to me. Well, I had remarried, and uh, this time I had some responsibility. I had three children in three years. That's easy to do. And my doctor said that he thought that they just needed to install a trap door, that it would save a lot of time and money. And my mother told me that I was just like shelling peas. And I just kept having these babies. Well, needless to say, I certainly couldn't work. And all during those pregnancies I drank, they carried me out of a sleazy nightclub when I was eight and a half months pregnant with my second child. You know, I was in the throes of alcoholism, but I wouldn't admit it because I knew what alcoholics had to do in order to get into AA. And I hadn't done those things yet. Hadn't done them. We moved to California. We did a geographic. The only problem was I took myself with me. I continued to do the same things. I had those three little kids, and I had all that responsibility. I had every characteristic and defect, you know, of a blooming alcoholic. My weight had gone up to 170 pounds. If I'd have rolled over, I'd been in Cleveland. <laughs> I, uh, I looked at myself in the mirror one time when I was drinking. I was 36 years old. And I looked like I was 72. And I was heavy. And I had uh, gotten down to, uh, you know, you have a drinking dress if you're a female alcoholic. And that's all you wear is this drinking dress. And you wear it morning, noon, and night. You sleep in it. And mine was a moo-moo. And it fit tight, real tight. If I would have taken that dress off, it would have broken And uh, if I knew if I took a shower, I'd melt. And I was a lovely sight. And uh, by then, the insanity awareness had set in. And I knew that I was crazy. I knew that I was. But I could not relate my insanity to my drinking. I was crazy when I was sober. And when I drank, there was some relief. I could stand it. I could stand it. And I had those damn kids and this responsibility. And I couldn't work. And I wasn't a member of the bar in California. And there wasn't anything to do. I was just in prison. But it was when I was sober that I was nuts. And if I could just get a couple of belts... My environment changed, and I could stand the husband, I could stand the children, and I could stand my life. But I'd wake up the next morning. I was afraid to get out of bed. I could not face the day until I had a drink. And I started doing the things that the alcoholics had talked about around the breakfast room table. When my children came into the kitchen, I had reached the point in my insanity, sober, that I did not know what I would do. I could not predict my behavior. And I would shut the drawers in my kitchen that contained the kitchen knives because I did not know what I would do if they provoked me. I was conscious of doing that. And I knew that I was going to end up in the insane asylum and those little children would come to visit me on Sunday with a picnic basket. I had seen all of the things that were going to happen. I knew that if I didn't drink, that I was going to die. And I knew that if I did drink, I was going to die. I knew that I had to stop and I couldn't quit. I don't know what happened. I can't tell you. I don't understand 
all of the things that we go through in this horrible, insidious, progressive disease. I know that I had a soul sickness, and I know that I was blasphemous, and I knew that if God was up there, that God was a punishing, vengeful God and was giving me more than I deserved, and I wanted nothing to do with him. We had been evicted. We had lived in Malibu on the beach. I lived next door to Julie Andrews. We were evicted because we couldn't pay the rent. My husband couldn't work because he had to stay home and I take care of the children. I couldn't take care of them. And I was being hauled to the Malibu Emergency Clinic all of the time for just insane moments of alcoholism, drunk. And so we were living in a transient apartment house on Ventura Boulevard in Los Angeles. And I was sitting on the wrought iron steps. And I said the only sincere prayer that I had said up to that time. I said, God, if you are there, if, always condition it, if you are there, Please help me. And nothing happened. For a period of three more months, I continued to drink. Because God in infinite wisdom knew that I had to hit my bottom. And I wasn't there yet. I was on my way down. And so we had moved. And my husband had gotten a job. And we had moved into Van Nuys, California. And... Uh, on February the 11th, it's vivid. I was, I, I remember, you know, you have to remember your last drunk, or they say you haven't had it. And I remember I was sitting in the living room and I was drunk. And I'd been drinking all day. And it had come to my mind, and I was conscious of the fact that I had no willpower. We would go places, and there would be people serving drinks on trays in social festivities, and I would say to myself, I will not drink tonight. I will not drink. And the person would pass by with that tray. I had no control over my hand. No control. And I would reach up and I would take the drink and I could not help myself. I could not refuse it. It was an absolute compulsion. And it was that thing that those out talked about around the breakfast room table, and I never understood. I never understood that my mother didn't have any willpower until I didn't have any. That night, I don't know what happened. I said, this is it. And I got up and I walked into the kitchen sink. I have had more things happen to me brain-wise and breakthroughs over my kitchen sink. And I just stood there. And I poured that drink down the sink. And I knew everything there was to know about Alcoholics Anonymous. I could quote you verse and page. And I walked over to the phone and I was so drunk I couldn't, I couldn't call. So I punched operator. She answered and I said, would you get me Alcoholics Anonymous? And I guess out in Los Angeles, those operators have a lot of calls like that. She said, where do you live? And I gave her the address and she called the Radford Clubhouse and someone answered and they said Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, uh, I would like to talk with someone. And the person said, do you think you have a drinking problem? Well, you know how arrogant we are. Even when we surrender, we're arrogant. You know? And I said, well, why do you think I'm calling, fool? And so he said just a minute, and he put someone on the line, and they talked with me, and he said, we'll be there. And they made that 12-step call. And they walked in my house. And before they came, I dolled up. 
And I went in and I put on some mascara. Of course, crying. They got there, I looked like Tammy Faye Baker. Just <laughs> hadn't had a bath yet, but I did get out of the Moo Moo dress. And they came in and thank God, thank God. The first thing that they said was, if you have a drinking problem, we can help you. Rather than, do you have hospitalization? And those people talked to me that night, and it was the first time in my life that I was able to communicate with another human being. No one understood anywhere how I felt. I'd made my surrender and I didn't even know that I had. I could not believe. I didn't want to talk to this lady that had been nine years sober. That's inconceivable to a newcomer. I didn't want to talk to the man who had been five years sober. That's too long. I wanted to talk to the newcomer, three months sober. She came on the 12-step call with him. The court had stepped in and had taken her children away from her because she was an unfit mother. I knew that was going to happen to me. And I said to her, how do you stay sober? How do you do this since this has happened to you? And her answer was something that I had heard a million times in my life, but I never listened. Her answer was, I do it a day at a time. Man, so simple. It's the first time I ever listened to that. She said, pretty soon you'll have a week, and then you'll get two weeks. She said, I've got three months. I told those people that I felt like I was in a grave, an open grave, and the world was marching by me, and they were kicking dirt in on my face. And their response was, we know, we know. Everything that I tried to tell them, the loneliness, the despair, and I didn't have any words that were labels because I didn't know what was wrong. You see, it's not until you get into the program that you begin to ferret out what these emotions are. I didn't know I had resentments. I hated a lot of people, but I didn't know what was wrong with me. And they told me that night, drinking is not your problem. Now, that's insanity. They said, drinking is your solution. I told them, I'm crazy when I don't drink. My pain, the suffering when I am sober is intolerable and I can't stand it. And they said, drinking is is your solution. Living is your problem. And I never connected the two. I'd never put that together in my brain. With all of this brain power that I had up here, I never figured that out. And so, they said, do you have whiskey in your house? I said, yes, I do. They said, let's get rid of it. I said, why? Because they were trying to tell me what to do. And they said, because you don't keep a rattlesnake in your house. I understood that. So we got rid of the whiskey. And they told me things like that (laughs) things would get better. And I didn't see how they would. They said, we're going to start calling you when you have your first drink. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that I knew that alcoholics drank in the morning and that I never would drink in the morning. Well, let me tell you how cunning and crafty we are. I figured out that alcoholics drink in the morning, and so I'd wake up in the morning, and the first thing that I would think of 
would be, well, it's California time and it's now 9 o'clock or 8 o'clock. Consequently, it's 12 noon in New York, and they're certainly drinking at lunch. And over in England, it's in the evening, and they're drinking tonight. So I'm going to drink London time. And that's how I rationalized my way out of drinking in the morning. And so they started calling me, and they called every five minutes. God bless those people. I don't even know their last names. I, didn't, I don't even remember the name of the girl who had been sober three months. But those people called me all day long. All day long. And then they gave me telephone numbers of people to call. I said, I don't know them. They said, it doesn't matter. Just call them. Tell them you're brand new and you want a drink. And they'll stop and they'll talk to you. We promise. I'd call up strangers. And I'd say, I've just been sober since this morning. And I want a drink. And these people would talk to me. And they'd talk to me 10, 15 minutes. And by the time I finished talking with them, the desire, the compulsion to drink was gone. And then pretty soon the phone would ring and it would be the other people calling me. They talked to me through that day. They didn't know who I was. They did not ask me if I was from Yale or jail. They didn't ask me for my pedigree. They didn't ask me for my Dun & Bradstreet report. They called because an alcoholic loves another alcoholic and they cared and no one had ever cared before and so they picked me up and they took me to meeting that night and there was an old beer sign and they had painted through it and it said we care I couldn't believe that and people got up and they talked about feelings and emotions and the things that they have always talked about but that I never heard. There's an old saying, and you don't hear it much anymore, that when we are teachable, the teacher will appear. And I had become teachable the night of my surrender. I listened to what they had to say. I identified myself right back into Alcoholics Anonymous. The emotional identification and the fear, the horrible fear. One man got up and he said, if you are brand new and you're scared, and I was so scared. I was scared to go to sleep at night because I was afraid that I would die in my sleep. I was scared to get up in the morning. I was scared of everything. I could not go to the grocery store and make a decision about what to buy. I, I didn't know whether to buy soap or bread. My mind was so far gone. I couldn't even sit down and read a law book. He said, if you're afraid, I want you to take all of the fear that you have and I want you to mash it into a great big ball, just like this. And then he said, I want you to take a knife and I want you to cut through the center of that ball just like a knife, hot knife through butter. And he said, half of that fear is going to fall away. That's because you've walked through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said, I promise you that those of us in here will take care of the other half. Well, that was my introduction into AA. They loved me into sobriety, and it was a tough love. It was a tough love. They didn't understand who I was. They asked me to carry my coffee cup and my ashtray back. They didn't understand I was a guest. It, you don't do that to guests. And so I started trying to explain to them that I was an English major in college and that there were certain parts of the big book where the grammar was wrong, and that I intended to write the general service office and have that corrected. And uh, <coughs> this one guy standing there, and he said, What? 
I said, well, I was an English major. He said, so I'm a French general. Shut up, sit down, and listen. <laughs> and that's exactly what I did. I had always learned in my English classes that there's one word that we just don't use, and that's the word got. It is absolutely superfluous in the English language. You do not say, I've got to go to the store. I've got lessons to do. What have you got? You just don't use that word because it's improper. And I picked up the big book and it said, you can't give away what you haven't got. <laughs> well, that obviously needed to be changed. And so I took it upon myself to explain to these people. And they said to me, you know, Yvonne, there are hundreds of thousands of folks that come into AA that have gotten sober and stayed sober with the words in that book. And those words are so simple that they appeal to rummies like you. And you just better leave them alone. Well, you know, I'd get mad at them. And uh, well, those fools could not even pronounce the word anonymity. And I understood everything that was going on. And I would tell them all about what happened in the olden days. And every time I offered these suggestions, they would always say to me, sit down and shut up and listen. And I think that I came in just subterranean. Most people are crazy, and I was just below ground. I did exactly what they told me to do. I resented them. I uh, allowed them to superimpose their inferior intellect over mine. And lo and behold... I discovered I'd been sober a week. I had never gone that long in my life. They said, you give thanks in the morning. I mean, you ask for, uh, in the morning to stay sober, give thanks at night. I said, I don't believe in that stuff. They said, you do it. And I'd do it. And I didn't believe it. And I didn't mean it. And I would call up and I said, I'm crazy. What am I going to do? They said, clean your house. I said, I've cleaned my house. They said, scrub your floor. So I'd scrub my floor, and I'd call them back, and I'd say, I've scrubbed my floor. They said, scrub it again. I'd scrub the floor again. I got to the point that I was cleaning out my refrigerator with Q-tips. <laughs> I did everything that those fools asked me to do. I followed it to the letter. I tried. I wanted to stay sober so badly, I was willing to try any gimmick I could find. I usually wanted to start drinking at 3 o'clock. So what I would do is I would set the clock back to 1 o'clock when it was 3. Then, when it was 3 o'clock, you know, on my clock, I really knew it was 5. And I really wanted to drink at 5. And I just kept turning my clock back. And then, when it really, in real life, was 7.30, I knew that it was going to be time to get ready to go to an AA meeting. But it might only say 4.30 on my clock. I kept setting the clock back so I wouldn't drink. I did everything in the world they told me so I wouldn't drink. I wanted to stay sober and couldn't. But I did what they said. And it worked. That's why I say to you, I can't tell you how it worked. It just worked. You just do what those people say. And you don't question them. Or they're going to say, shut up and sit down and listen. And you're not going to ever get an explanation. And I used to stand at the kitchen sink, my favorite place, to get ideas. And I'd say, well, if I work this program and I take all of these steps and I get rid of all of these character defects, they've already told me that alcohol is not my problem, that living is my problem. So I get rid of the character defects, I become a whole person again. And if I become a whole person, then drinking won't bother me. And so I can take five, six, and seven, and I can drink. And then it dawned on me that there's another part of that silly big book. And it says, Do not be discouraged. <laughs> no one among us has heard anything. <laughs> <coughs> perfect with these principles we are not saints 
And it talks about ours as spiritual progress and not spiritual perfection. And that we never get perfect and we never get rid of all of our defects. There are two silly old stories that saved my life in Alcoholics Anonymous. Once there was a... Well, when they made their 12-step call on me, remember it was February, I said to them when we were talking, I said, what am I going to do about drinking Christmas at the Christmas parties? And they said, Yvonne, we'll worry about that when Christmas comes. I went to an AA meeting, and they were telling this story about this girl, and she was way overweight, and she went on a diet. And she lost the weight, and she really looked super. And she bought herself a real skinny bikini. And she put it on, and she trotted herself out on the beach. And she laid down on the beach, and she was just lollygagging around. And a guy walked by, and he looked at her, and he said, Hi. And she said, But I can't cook. That's called projection. And I want to tell you, that saved my life a million times. Because my tendency is man project. Just man project. Well, I got sober by doing the things that they told me to do. God, I had a terrible time with that fourth and fifth step. I took it on a matchbook cover. That's all I could find wrong with me. And then pretty soon I got a little more honest and I took it on a three-by-five card. And I kept taking it with different folk because I didn't want to lay it off on someone. So finally the time came when I knew I had to get serious about it. And I took that fourth and fifth step and uh, the person that I took it with pointed out to me that the thing that was really wrong with me and that was the root of everything that I had ever done in my entire life, be it conquering, be it lying, be it stealing, the deceit, everything, was my feeling of the lack of self-worth. I didn't feel like I had a right to breathe the air in my square footage that was allotted me. And I asked that that defect of character be removed. My life became Cinderella again. After I quit drinking and got my head together, I returned to the state of Oklahoma and became assistant attorney general in the criminal division. My job was to put people in jail and try cases where people had been murdered by a defendant in an alcoholic rage. And I thought constantly, there but for the grace of God. There but for the grace of God. I was then appointed to the bench. The first woman in the state appointed to a state bench. And uh, everything just unfolded. It became necessary in 1972. I hadn't been sober very long. But those people who made that 12-step call on me that night in my home said, uh, Yvonne, you and your husband are either going to have to grow together in this program or you'll grow apart. And that's exactly what happened because I had changed. My values had changed. My priorities had changed. Uh... And it was necessary for my sobriety that we divorce. And so I was in, in a position of, I was on the bench, and I was raising three children. I had those little babies. And we had taken my oldest son back to see Judge Murrah. Only person calling him Judge Fish to his face. And Judge Murrah thought he was wonderful. And uh, I was raising those children alone. And if there's anything that I was not interested in, it was in remarrying. So what do you think I did? I married a practicing alcoholic. <laughs> and I thought I knew everything. The only problem was I never saw the man drink. He was a lawyer. 
and he practiced in my court, and uh, he was what you call a periodic. Now, I understand periodics about as much as I do social drinkers. I just don't understand it. I mean, you know, if you're going to drink, you do it every day, and you get it on. If you get mad or upset or nervous, you drink every day. And these people that can postpone and just drink every two or three months are just, you know, I don't understand that. And so anyway, he was a periodic, and uh, I never saw him drink ever, ever. The only time that he would drink was when I would go away to AA conferences. <laughs> and so he'd have a whole weekend, and he'd store up, and he'd just get dog-dead drunk. And then I would go home, and he'd sober up by the time I got home. Except this one, and he pl oh, he loved for me to go to conferences, loved it. He's even wanting to call up and pay my way if they'd just ask me to get me out of town. Because that meant a good drunk for him. He wanted me to leave on Wednesday. <laughs> and so this one time, uh, I left and uh, went to a uh, conference in Arkansas. And so he, uh, he got drunk. Only this time he got caught because he wrecked the car. And he was driving a little MGB car flip. And uh, threw him out. It skidded 40 feet on its top, and he came to, and he was in a ditch, and he heard voices saying, there's got to be a body around here someplace. Well, being the honest lawyer that he is, he knew he better lay in the weeds, because if they found him, that they would give him the breathalyzer. So he hid. So he crawled through the weeds, and he crawled back to the house, and pretty soon they traced the license tag and they called him up and he was there they said we want to come up and see you well he knew he was drunk and he knew he was going to be in trouble and so uh, <coughs> he ran out and he hid in the woods and uh, he had his daughter come and she picked him up and she took him over we had a farm she took him over and she hid him out at the farm and so I got home and he was gone and uh, so he called me and uh, he told me what had happened. I said, are you hurt? And he said, no, I don't think so. And uh, I knew that something had to happen. I was on the bench at the time, and, you know, here's my husband, and he's left the scene of an accident, and the, uh, he's a fugitive from justice, and the police were asking, you know, what am I going to do when that's on the front page of the paper? And that he's drunk. And so... Uh, he called me the next morning, and he said, uh, would you call the people, my law firm, and tell them? He was senior partner in the law firm. He said, please tell them that I won't be in. Well, I've been around al enough to know you just don't do that. So I called the law firm, and I said, uh, Henry's at the farm, and he's drunk, and he's been in a car wreck. Flick. And so that evening, he started calling me. He says, well, I think maybe I go, ought to go to AA. And he'd been going to al and, you know, getting drunk after the meetings with the guys, I guess. I don't know. And uh, al -Anons have a real neat deal. You know, they can drink and still work our program. <laughs> and so, anyway, he said, well, you call someone in AA and have them come. I said, no, I won't call them. You call them. He said, well, I can't because I broke my glasses in the car wreck. I said, well, you tell me who you want. I'll give you the phone number and you can call them. And so, uh, I don't know what he did. Alan Ons, you know, they said, don't you do anything. What I wanted to do was just go over there, get a big stick, and just stir it all up. And just get everything worked out and just fix everybody. You do this, and you do this, and you do this. And they said, leave it alone. And I said, well, he hadn't eaten in two days. And they, Alan Ons said, well, you just let him go beg some food. Just go up down the street and beg food. I said, well, he doesn't have any coffee. And they said, well, let him go beg coffee. They said, you stay out of it. So he did exactly what the Alman said do. And uh, he called, and I made some soup. And I said, well, you can come over and get some soup if you haven't eaten. Because I felt sorry for him. I mean, he was pathetic. And he came to the door, and he had scabs all over his head. Oh, it was awful. And he said, I guess I better go to an AA meeting. And I said, yeah, I guess. It's up to you. So uh, he went to his AA meeting, and this May he's going to celebrate his uh, 
27th birthday. <laughs> Pretty good, but we've had problems along the way. And my three children, uh, my oldest boy uh, was a state narcotics agent. My youngest daughter was well on it when she was in high school. And uh, she was expelled for possession, as a matter of fact. And uh, he was out chopping it, and she was out smoking it. And I had a hell of a time keeping these kids apart. Because he was arresting, and she was running from the law, and it was a mess. And so anyway, uh, we had an awful time with her, and I had to learn that lesson too. I did everything I'd... Everything I did was wrong. I, everything that I did, I had her in five colleges thinking it was the crowd she ran in. You know, you always want to make the excuses. And finally, when she flunked out of the fifth college, I said, put your things in a cardboard box and we're bringing you home. And we brought her home and uh, she volunteered to try to get some help. And she did. And uh, she's been sober 15 years now. And it's just neat. My oldest boy, who was a narcotics agent, decided that uh, that he wanted to improve himself, and so he went to uh, he made his application with the FBI and with the federal DEA, and uh, so he was accepted. And uh, by the DEA and by the FBI, he had his choice. And so he was supposed to take his, the last interview that they have before you're finally accepted. It's very difficult to become a federal agent, and he was supposed to be interviewed in Oklahoma City. And he wanted that more than anything on the account of he had worked with the DEA agents in Oklahoma City, and uh, he knew that they would give him a good report. But he got a letter. And the letter said that he couldn't be interviewed there, that he had to go down to Dallas. <coughs> and that boy <coughs> got in the car and he drove to Dallas. And uh, he was mad and I was mad and, you know, we thought it was a raunchy deal. And on April the 19th, precisely, at 9.02 in 1995, my son was in the regional office in Dallas for his interview instead of sitting in the AP Judge Fish Murrah building in Oklahoma City when it was blown up and all of the DE agents were killed. These are miracles in my life and I don't know why they've happened. My father became sick in 1988 and there was no hope for his recovery. And uh, he was in the hospital and he was, he was uh, taking chemo and the outlook was two or three months. And so I, I didn't know how to pray. And I just said, God, whatever whatever you do, just don't let this man suffer. Just don't let this man suffer. And in the middle of the night, I received a phone call. And when I got off of the elevator and the pastor of the hospital was standing there, I knew that it had happened. And he died of something completely different in his sleep peacefully. And he didn't suffer. These are miracles. Miracles that have happened in my life. After he died, it became quite apparent, and I had never known up until that time, that my mother was very sick. My mother was having 40 years of sobriety in AA, and she wasn't tracking. And I didn't know what was wrong with her. And uh, she began losing things, and she began doing bizarre things, and... and uh, She's diagnosed as having Alzheimer's disease, and that's a horrible thing. And so for the next six years, I became her, her caregiver, and I took care of her. And during that period of time, I was able to make the amends to her. We think that we've made them all, but when you have a chance and you reflect, the times that she stayed up and worried about me and the pain that I put her through with my highfalutin travels and my I cut didos every place I went, you know, partying. And uh, with all of that, I was able to take care of her. 
And she got to the point that she didn't even know who I was. And I would go see her. She was in the nursing home. She did not know my name. She said that she had never been married. She said that she had no children. And I want to tell you something scary. They took her into the dining room. She couldn't even remember Alcoholics Anonymous. She did not know Bob's name. She didn't know who Bill Wilson's name was. He didn't know who he was. But they took her into the dining room. Her conscious mind was gone. And my mother asked for the wine list because she wanted to drink. Now, you talk about a disease that is cunning and baffling and powerful and patient and permeating into the very soul is the disease of alcoholism. They called me and they said that she wasn't uh, going to make it. And I went up to the nursing home where she was. I had done everything I could to make my amends. I was there all the time in that nursing home. And uh, I was able to do for her the things that she did for me when I was little and growing up. Uh, and so I said, Mama, and she was comatose. I said, Mama, if you're there, I said, if you can hear me. I said, would you just squeeze my hand? And she did nothing. And I said, my mother, I said, would you just blink your eyes if you can hear what I'm saying? And she did nothing. And so I had heard that you have to give people permission to go. And so I said, mother, I said, I just want you to know that my brother and I are going to be okay. And, and the grandchildren are going to be okay. And daddy's been waiting on you a long time. And if the time has come that you must go now, you have our permission and go and be with daddy. Be the place where you're supposed to be. And there was no response. And I looked at her face and tears were streaming down her cheek. And she heard me. Miracles and Alcoholics Anonymous and I can't explain how it works. I don't know. It's kind of like trying to tell someone who is blind what the color white is like. And to us, we would say, well, it's like snow. White is like snow. And to the blind person, it would mean that the color white was cold and wet. We can't communicate with people who can't see as we see. The world is blind. When we talk about our disease, when we talk about our emotions, and it was only through this language of the heart with the words of we know that you captured me and I knew that I had a place to come. I've heard people speak from the podium and they have said, we have a choice today. We can either drink or not drink. Well, if you're new, I'm here to tell you that we don't have a choice as to whether we're going to drink or not drink. All of our choices have been taken away from us. We have a choice as to whether we want to be miserable. We're happy. Whether we want to suffer or we'll try to find some serenity. But when it comes to a choice of drinking or not drinking, that choice is living or dying. And it's that simple. There's a story of the old wise man who was in a tribe. And he knew all things and he had all answers. And so a bunch of, of the young, younger people, the rebels, said, we're going to disgrace that old man. We're going to embarrass him in front of the tribe. And they will see that he is not wise. And he is not sagacious. And so they said, we're going to take a bird. And we're going to hold it in our hand. And we're going to ask him if the bird is alive or if it's dead. And if he says the bird is alive, we'll break its neck. 
And if he says, well, the bird is dead, we'll open up our hands and we'll let the bird fly away. And so that night they went to the old man at the tribal meeting and they said, old man, old man, what have we here? And he said, it's a bird. And they said, is the bird alive or is it dead? And the old man said, the choice is yours. And I say to you, my friends, living or dying, the choice is yours. Thank you.